Hi, Neil. Thanks for Hi. joining us. Um, and thank you for the gig last night. I really enjoyed it. Was it you, in your book? You talk about some gigs being more successful than others. Was it? Was it? Was, it, was this a good one for you? Well, it wasn't that good for me, as I had a commentator in my head talking to me all night that distracted me. But I think it was overall it was a good gig. Well, you did very well to because the, the the rapport. What, what the people I was with, what people loved about it. I mean, the music was fantastic, but they loved the rapport that you had with the band. Someone said to me, it was like a, a lion with with this kind of pride, the, the relationship you seem to have with the band. That's, uh, it, what's That's it like cool. playing with, some, with, with, with those guys? Well, it's great. I mean, they're like uh, my brothers, my sons, my fathers. I mean, they're, it's all one thing. So uh, it, regardless of their age, it doesn't make any difference. They're excellent uh, musicians, but even more important than their technical abilities, which are quite uh, astounding yeah. is the uh, uh, their 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 uh, spiritual and mental capacity. I love the way they watch you. You know, when you're that's this kind of lion and pride thing. Is they watch you really carefully, as if they're kind of and it's it's there's something quite magical about that. Well, you know, we we uh, that's the way bands are. You know, when bands play, if you see bands that are really in tune, yeah, you know, they they do that. They're they're aware of everything that's going on. That's what makes it. Well, so I'm sorry it didn't feel good for you, but it felt good for us watching. Yeah, well, it, was, it wasn't that it didn't feel good. I think it was just I had my own demons and my own mental problems to deal with. And, uh, you know, always feels good to, to make music while it's happening. But there's, there's a lot going on behind the scenes. What I want to do in the, the time we've got, Neil, if it's okay with you, is I want to talk about two ideas which seem to me to run through your whole career. And I'm interested in those ideas and I'm interested in, in the relationship between them. So the first idea, picking up on that promise of the real, is the importance of authenticity in your life. I mean, your book starts with you trying to create the authentic sound of a model railway, you know, how it should how it should actually sound. And then, you know, reading through the book, you come back to this, this look for authenticity. And of course, it's a big thing for Pono in terms of the music, but also, uh, Earth, that whole concept of nature, your support for organic food and all that kind of stuff. So t tell us about this, th this idea of realness and authenticity. Well, you've described it. <laughs> you described it very well. I, I, I think uh, I, I, to me it just matters in a very big way that, uh, that things are what they are. They have to be, it has to be real. You can, uh, pretty well un, un, unwatered down. And, and what is that? What is that realness about? Is it about? It's not just about age, is it? It's about the quality of something. It's just you know, um, pureness. Like you don't want to be thinking about something else while you're doing something. You want to be engrossed in that. That's what bothered me last night. Was my mind kept tricking me, and and I kept having. A commentator talking about different things in my head, little little things, but distracting nonetheless. And uh, and, and and so the music wasn't pure; it was diluted by that. For me, my experience. A lot of people watching couldn't tell that. And that's fine. Um, but the night before, we had none of that. Right. And the difference is astounding to me. Um, and I'm sure that if you look at the two shows, you'll see a difference in me. But the overall impression for someone looking at it for the first time is there are probably similar shows. So but in, but when you're looking at a vintage car or you're talking about music or you're talking about seeds and, and nature, is there some common idea that is running through what it is that you love about those things, about what they, that what they represent? Well, with the vintage car, I'd like it to be an original. Yeah. I don't really uh, crave a perfectly restored car. I would rather see one that is, has been taken care of, but not altered. So if it has a few bruises, that's okay. Mm. You know, it's nice if everything's in really good shape. That's, to me, a really good car. And a really good seed would be one that, uh, you know, is basically a natural thing that happened by itself. It doesn't need anything else done to it. 
So um, it's, a, it's a kind of combination of age and of quality. And you talk a lot, you use this word spirit a lot in your writing and in your, in your music. Is that also part of it, that somehow these things contain within them this thing that you refer to as, yeah, as a spirit? Yeah, well, I think the cars carry the spirits with them of the people who've traveled in the cars. And the less you do to the car, um, probably the more clear and vivid those those memories in the car are. Mm -hmm. So if you completely rebuild the car, they're still in there, but they're confused. And, and this my, my sensibility says that. I don't know if it's true. I just that's how I feel. And this then runs into your work on music and Pono in the last few years where it, it, there's an urgency in your sense that you want people to hear how authentic music ought to, ought to hear that's, and that people aren't, aren't hearing it. That's right. I think authentic music, uh, uh, music, it's just, it's just music. It's the real original music. If there's a great recording of something that was done and approved by the artist when it was made, that's what I want to hear. I don't want to hear anything else. I don't want to hear anything done to it. I don't want to hear it changed or altered in any way at all. I want to hear that because that's what the artist blessed. That is truly the signature of the artist. Even though that music would itself have been built up over, you know, tracks that have been recorded on top. So it's not actually a recording of a live performance, is it? It doesn't have to be. Uh, like a painting is not a, is not a live performance either. It's not a photograph. It's like, they're different. So creation of art one way or another. I mean, it's like, uh, okay, I, it, it was a bad analogy. If I play a song with a band and we record it and then we don't do anything to it, then that's a documentary. Okay. But yeah. if I, if it, it's a, sh it's a shot of the creation of it and you got it all. If, uh, if it's a song that we built in the studio, that's a painting. It's a it's a uh, assemblage, right? And you, you don't want people to tinker with that at all. You want people. I don't to want them to do anything to it. Yeah. So when it comes to because you, you look at the guitars you play for many years, but you've adapted those in various ways, and the the wanting to make the at the beginning of your book the model train sound authentic. I, I'm getting that it's not that you you have to preserve things. Completely, but if you are going to adapt them, you've got to adapt them in the same spirit as they were created. You've got to, that, that's what's got to be driving you. That same notion of, of idea of quality or? Well, you know, I just want to get as close to the experience as possible, to the original experience with what I have now. And sometimes, um, well, in the instance of the trains, all I had was recordings of trains yeah. and a moving model. So I tried to marry the recordings to the moving model so that the recordings would play at the appropriate times when the model moved. Yeah. So you have the sound of the, of the original train and you have the model of the train moving and the sounds of the model of the train are actually coming out of the model in synchronized. Which is that notion of authenticity again. Yeah, that it actually well, it's is the, the real, engine. it's the real, you've got the real type of engine and it may not have been the actual uh, one with the same number on it that the model is, but it's the same type. And uh, so uh, that's where you have to draw the line with that one. And this realness idea carries into your political campaigning around GM foods and things like that, wanting people to understand real food and real farming. And Yeah, real, just, we can't do, continue to uh, screw with nature. That just doesn't work. Uh, it's not a good idea. Diversity is what the planet needs. We need diversity in, in our lives. In my view, uh, destroying diversity is a huge crime. And, you know, uh, we have intellectual property laws around the world, and different countries have different ways of addressing it. But I've never seen a country that has an intellectual property uh, law that protects original creation. Mm. Now, how can you have it so that man's creation is protected in today's modern world, but the original creation is just open to trashing it and there's no penalty? Mm. How can that be? Where's the, where's the love in that?
you know, you, you've had just the most remarkably creative life. We talk at the RSA about the power to create. That's our kind of mission statement, which is to have a world where everybody feels the capacity to be creative in their lives. Do you think we can all? Is that a pipe dream, or can we all be creative? Or is our, are there just some people who, who are more creative than others? Well, I think that some people are more creative than others, but I think the opportunity to be creative should be equal. And do you think we emphasize that enough now? No, I, mean, I don't think so. I don't think so. I mean, and I don't know all of the ways that we could do it better. I mean, that would be a lifetime of studying just to figure it's half or half of a percentage point of that out <laughs> to figure out how we can make everybody be more creative or be uh, able to be more creative. But it has to have to do with education. Hmm. I don't think we do even think schools. about it in education. I mean, at the moment, people focus so much on standards and exams. There isn't much emphasis on how you f nurture creativity in young people yeah. in school. There is no creativity class. It's not even a subject. And do you think that making is part of that? Because the other thing we're, we're interested in is the kind of makers movement, people rediscovering making, you know, using new technologies, and, you know, um, 3D printing and laser cutting and those kind of things to go back to kind of small scale manufacturing and stuff like that. Do you think it's important for people to get their hands on that materiality that you talk about? Well, I think that, that you know, 3D printing and all of those things and those new tools that are coming out with the, in the uh, age of computer control and machines and nanotechnology as, you know, there's a great amount of promise in that, you know, because it will uh, essentially, just as uh, as large companies now create mechanical things and sell them, like car companies and things like that, as these tools become more mainstream, uh, people will be able to use them much the same way as, as, as and do things like, like now people can make records at home. They can do all kinds of things at home that they couldn't do at home, that they used to have to go mm -hmm. somewhere to do. Uh, and it's, uh, uh, so there's no reason to think that in the future someone wouldn't be able to design something and, and create all the parts and put it together and use it in their own house. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a, you know, that's, that's just not too far away, I don't think. Because that's one of the interesting things is that, is that you know, someone at your show last night and it starts off with people spreading seeds and then there's kind of these kind of you know, figures come on with the pesticides. People might think, oh, this is somebody who is a technophobe. This is somebody who doesn't really like the way things are going. But actually, you're an enthusiast for lots of technological innovation. I really am. I also really like responsible innovation. You know, there has to be a, there has to be a, uh, a responsibility with what you do. And uh, people who are creating these things for their own gain, really, and trying to dupe the world into thinking that that the foods that they're creating, the, like Monsanto companies and Bayer companies like that, that they're creating uh, uh, seeds and, uh, and technologies and, and things like that because they want to feed the world. That's just marketing. It has nothing to do with reality. Scientific studies prove that you cannot, uh, that, that, that using GMOs and using all the pesticides and everything does not mean a greater yield. Would you be as opposed to GMOs if they were being exclusively developed by the United Nations, for example? Or is it, is it the corporate control of it or is it the, the technology itself? Well, it's, 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 it's not even, it's, it's, it's uh, the irresponsibility that that is rampant where you create a seed and then the seed becomes in the part of the world and the seed travels through the air through the water and everywhere and goes to a different place and now has an impact on other seeds and now like uh, you have polluted seeds uh, organic seeds with Monsanto seeds mixed in mm -hmm. And if the farmer is, you know, then they're trying to sell organic food, they have no protection. They have no protection against this. It's, it just wasn't thought of. And the, and the way they deal with it is if you, the illustrations that I have of cases, true cases that have happened in the U.S. where, where this has gone to such a ridiculous state that it's a great example for the rest of the world of why not to do this mm. is what's happened. 
with uh, seed companies uh, who will test your a farmer's crops, and if they find their seeds in it, then they say, you have to pay us, you know, a royalty for using our seeds. Mm. And, you know, they didn't buy the seeds. So they're, now they're liable. The seeds blew into their property, and now they're liable for using them yeah. because they're protected by intellectual property uh, laws. And at the same side, the organic farmers have no protection uh, from the uh, contamination of these GMO seeds. There's just so many things wrong and so many things that these so-called scientific experts have come up with uh, these huge breakthroughs that really all they are is ways to make money. There's really, you know, man, man has always died. You know, the essence of the whole thing is man's need to control nature. For some reason, man is the only creature on earth that thinks that it should be able to harness nature, control nature, m instead of realizing that re really the great dawn of awakening is going to be living with nature and and uh, being in harmony with it. And it's more than just, you know, words of a, of a uh, uh, new age thinker or something. It's truly the way forward. And it's, uh, you know, it's the only way to keep it, to keep it pure and to keep it good. And for us to actually grow and still have something left at the end that resembles what it is we started with. And and it's not just something where we screwed everything up. See, it seems to me, Neil, that this recurrent question in your life, which is this balance between authenticity and the real and the desire for invention and innovation, it is absolutely the question of our time. We are probably going to see more change in the next 20 or 30 years than you know, we've ever seen before as with artificial intelligence and nanotechnology, genetic manipulation, all these kind of things. And so in this world, what are the values that we need to make sure that this technological possibility is used to human benefit and to the benefit of the world? Well, that's what governments are supposed to do. They're supposed to have responsibility for the people that they govern. That's why they're elected. They're supposed to have, they're supposed to be guardians of the environment of where the people are. They're supposed to keep the water clean. They're supposed to keep the ground clean. They're supposed to preserve the diversity of the land that they're ruling. They've been elected to care for it. Mm. That's mm. what's that's what's missing is we don't have that. In a lot of cases, especially in America, we have the idea of democracy has been usurped and is now in need of a revolution because corporations are controlling governments. Corporations that have no responsibilities, no children, they don't have to worry about that. So that means they're not people, yet they vote like people. And it overcomes the, uh, the whole, uh, you know, in my view, it makes, uh, it makes democracy uh, meaningless. Mm. Democracy for corporations is, doesn't mean anything. It's not the idea. One vote, one person. That's the idea. So th this, I think this takes something really interesting, which is the idea that in balancing what we need to protect and cherish and respect and what we need to change, because we, there may be some technologies we worry about, but when we hear people might have a cure for cancer or a cure for, out, cure for Alzheimer's, over, that's, that's great. So we want technology to help us answer our problems and progress human beings, but we're worried about what technology might also do in terms of yeah. nature. So what we need is the right politics and the right democracy to steer a course through that. And, and, and a vision based in, in, uh, in, in not so much curing cancer, but preventing cancer. Mm -hmm. we, we are what we eat. You know, I mean, uh, there's this story of this American family that went to Sweden for a vacation. And they had all these allergies and everything, and they, the whole family <laughs> living in America was they were unhealthy and not feeling good. And they didn't have a great uh, diet in America. It's not a great diet to eat, you know, cheeseburgers and a lot of a lot of dairy products and all the stuff that they eat, and a lot of bread and uh, you know stuff not to you know not, not to put uh, those foods down. But they went to Sweden, and they, and they started eating the same foods in Sweden, and they had no allergies. 
and they got healthy and they were feeling better. So it's, it's not the food type so much as how altered is the food and how much disease, how much glyphosate or, what, or mm -hmm. similar chemicals have been introduced. Why do we, would we need to cure cancer? Well, we're eating food that causes cancer. What is the benefit of creating a problem and then spending money to solve it? And, and Why these... not just not have the problem by being smart and using technology to stay smart, using nanotechnology, using all of these things that you're talking about, aside from genetically modifying the natural thing that life is coming from. When you start screwing with that and start screwing with all of the, the uh, uh, natural processes, water, sun, earth, wind, when you start screwing with all of those things and altering them so that man can be in control of nature, that's when nature gives you cancer, nature gives you diseases, debilitating, debilitating diseases that, that ruin people's lives. And what's the answer to that? More chemicals. We'll fight it with chemicals. We're geniuses. We're going to come up with a cure for cancer. No, they don't have a cure for cancer. They just have a multi-billion dollar cancer cure industry. And it's all there because of the things that are causing cancer. Whether some people uh, uh, theorize that it's caused by some kinds of cancer or caused by cell phones. Some are caused by electricity, by being close to transformers. Others are saying it's chemicals. Others like me say it's the GMOs and the, and the pesticides um, and the foods that cause it. The thing is, the idea is to not cause it and therefore not have to, so, you know, so I read this, cure it. I read this quote the other day, which, which because I was reading your book, just made me think of you immediately from, from John Muir. And he said, he, he, he said this, he said, the fight for beauty is, and this is his quote, not blind opposition to progress, but opposition to blind progress. And that made me think yes. of you. Yeah. And what I'm getting from this is that in not being opposed to progress, but being opposed to blind progress, the two, two ideas you want us to bear in mind are firstly, this notion of authenticity and real and not messing with things that have got a kind of history and have got a quality and respecting that. But also you're talking about politics and you're talking about power and decisions being made for the right reasons. Are these the two critical things that will help us make sure that we use this abundant technology for, for human good and for the good well, of the planet? As long as politicians are running the governments and, uh, and being paid by corporations in many countries, hopefully not any more countries, if, the, if people will just learn from the example of what happened to democracy in the United States of America, by seeing what's going on there now and what's happening with all those ridiculous things that that are going on there, uh, you know that you just have to be able to see that uh, that responsibility is a key thing when you elect a responsible leader who understands, you know. But people are so swayed by the advertising, which is paid for by the corporations. You don't have in, like, for instance, in England, the prime minister is not running a huge ad campaign on TV paid for by Monsanto that doesn't say Monsanto and it says something about we're going to, you know, make sure your babies, babies are healthy and we're going to give you better schools, all kinds of vague things that describe kind of without any facts good things that everybody can relate to. Mm. And they promise these things, but they really don't give you those things. They're actually beholden to people who are not doing those things, and they, they need to do. And like in the United States, a lot of people write laws. They're all lawyers writing laws, but they work for corporations. Then the corporations give the laws to the legislators, and then they pass them in government. That's American democracy. And that's you know hard to believe, but I'm not making that up. You do you can check it out, and you know, that's the way it works. It seems to me the thing that that in America and Europe have in common at the moment is that people feel very worried about the future. You know, there was a time I remember, you know, 30, 40 years ago that people felt the future would be better than the past. That was an assumption that we had, and now I think you know, and you, and you see it. Sometimes in a kind of left-wing protest, sometimes you see it in a right-wing protest, you see it across Europe, the extremes getting stronger. And at the heart of this is that people 
really worry about the future. Are you well, still an optimist? I'm, I'm optimistic about the human race, but uh, I think it's time for some hard decisions and it's probably time for revolution. I mean, I hope it's a peaceful revolution because the other kind of revolution never really does anything but perpetuate more strife, more strife, and more, more, uh, you know, more war and everything. But we, if we can ever get to a point where we can see that we have a lot in common, and that we are all on the planet together, there has to be some unifying thing that brings everybody together. Um, and can music still play that role now? Because you know, again reading your book, the, the idealism in the 60s and 70s, that music was part of a kind of revolutionary process that kind of burnt itself out. Can, can music be part of that peaceful revolution? Well, music is part of humanity. So I think music, music will be part of, of everything, the and, good and the bad. And just two final things, the, 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 the Pono thing, the, the, the thing about real music and the community of people committed to that. Yes, Real it's a great music. thing. And we're right at the, just in the embryo of it right now. So that's exciting too. And has a, has a revolutionary potential, you think? I mean, I, when I listened to the music through the, through the system, it did kind of blow me away slightly. I thought, my goodness, for so long I've been listening to stuff that is quite degraded, really. Quite degraded. So, yeah, I mean, it, 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 Pono's challenge is to, is to become mainstream. We don't want to be just a company for audiophiles uh, because... When I started making music, everybody was an audiophile by today's standards. Everybody heard high res. Mm. Vinyl was high res. Everybody had it. That's why people all loved music and they all related to music. Now we get 5% of the input. If you break it down into data, we have 5%, less than 5% of what we had in the 70s. So a lot of great songs were made in the 60s and 70s. People remember that culture, the music culture. That's when it really grew and the art of recording became very successful and everything was happening and a lot of recording studios and musicians and all kinds of people creating music. And that's the music that, that is truly lasting for generations and generations. That's referred to by today's musicians as the base of what they're doing. The fact is those, those advantages uh, that the musicians experienced during those times are, are significant advantages over today's musicians who are uh, basically, no matter how great they are at the source, they come to the listener through a small pipe. Mm. And then it comes out the other end and goes poof. Sometimes, uh, you know, it's uh, sometimes it's they use digital manipulation to make it sound bigger when it comes out the end, but it isn't bigger. It's just a fraction of what you should get. And the human body is an incredible... Uh, uh, tool. It's an incredible thing that has sensitivity, your whole body. So if you only give it 5% of the input, uh, it's not going to react like it would if it got 100% of the input. It would be happy to get 100% and, and have goosebumps and tears and, you know, rushes and everything listening to the music. But if you just give it a little bit, it's a, also a very aware and smart thing. It'll say, well, I've heard that. I don't have to hear it again. It sounds the same every time I listen to it. I'm not hearing anything new in it. I, I can't explore in it. There's no universe. And if people aren't listening to the real music, then they've got no sense of what it is they lose if that music That's right. Goes. They've been listening to it. So that's the challenge. That's the challenge. And you're it's building a, a community, challenge. aren't you? It's not just a technology. You're building a community We're of people. We're building a community of people uh, at, uh, at the Pono community that we hope to engage in the discussion of this and to... Uh, uh, be the the starting point for the you know revolution to, that brings true sound uh, back to the people. That's that's what we need to to try to do. Because if uh, you know the high resolution of Pono music allows the listener to feel the, the you know the density, the detail, the soul, the space, the nuance of the music itself, the way it was created. And the difference is immense between that and a, uh, a GMO piece of music. And that's, is that why one of the recurrent things in your, when you play gigs is that there's 
some of it's acoustic and some of it's electric. Is that, that's partly this kind of authenticity, innovation thing, but it's also because you're giving people a really wide set of experiences. I mean, at the, your concert last night, the, the, the early songs when you're just playing on your own, it's very quiet and it's very kind of mellow. And then, you know, the, towards the end when you're really going for it, this is a very wide palette of experiences that listener gets. Well, music is like that. You know, that's, it's all there. So I just, uh, some of my songs I did by myself. So I start with those kind of songs. And, and I also like to give people the songs that they, that they want to hear and get it over with. <laughs> so if I do it by myself, I, I not, don't have to be manipulated by, I don't have to be, you know, I can improvise. And I can move around in it and be free in it. So it's uh, essentially very free in some ways to do those older songs by myself. So I have some that I do either way with the band or by myself and I interchange them every night and do them different ways. I have right now over a hundred songs that I can do with this band. So, and it's growing every day. So, you know, the palette I have to deal with, to come from, is it's significant. I saw that in Leeds you played a song you hadn't played for nearly 50 years. Yeah, we played it again. Uh, no, I've never played it. <laughs> we recorded it and uh, built it overdubbed all the things myself on my first record. So it's never been performed. Amazing. And it was performed in Leeds and it was performed in London also. So maybe the biggest invention of all is you in the sense that you have reinvented yourself again and again. And in the book, you there's moments in the book when you say, you almost seem to be saying, will I be able to, how will I reinvent myself the next time? So you, are you still reinventing yourself? And what's the next I'm just doing the, the same thing over and over again. That's what I do. I, I, I'm not really, I'm just trying to, to, to stay true to what I believe in. And I do it in different ways. First of all, I, I, when I record a record, I try to just have an idea. But I have to wait for the idea. I can't think of it. You talk about the, like you talk about the spirit and you also talk about the muse. Is this other you thing which flows to, through yeah, you? Yeah, you have to be aware that this is not coming from you. Music is not something you create. You, you, you create a version of it but the source of it is is coming all around. So everybody has it. Some people are more tuned into it than others. But if you just if you just forget what you're doing and just do what you're not thinking of, that's that's a pure thing that's happening in your body by itself that you're picking up on. That's what I like to do. I like to, to do that. So I'll follow my own. Um, I just follow my own self when I and then when I have an idea to do another record, it's because I hear it. It's not because I think of what it's going to be and then create it. It's because I heard it and I'm trying to make it. In your book, you've just given up drinking, and you you worry in a book in the book about whether or not you're going to be able to to write when you're sober, as it were. Oh or yeah, you're not stoked. I think I gave up smoking weed. I think I still was drinking beer, but uh, you know, because I'm Canadian, I'm always going to drink beer. <laughs> But I think there's something about getting older. We live in a society which often looks down on old age and rock and roll is a youthful cult phenomenon. But actually, Hell, I there's something the about... I was with Pete Townsend the other day and he looks great. Yeah, He's but... like older than I am. He's like 70-something. And he just took off down the hallway of the airport like a ton of bricks. So I mean, new... you know, as a big man. We associate creativity with young people, but actually it seems to me there's a creativity that comes with experience and with age and with maturity and with the whole variety, the way in which all those experiences come together. Well, I think it's all there all the time, and no matter how old your body is, it doesn't matter. I think we're all there. It's all there for everybody. Everybody can have it. It doesn't matter how old you are, how young you are, how beat up you are, how fresh you are. It makes very little difference other than the physicality of being able to do things. Great. Thank you, Neil. Thank you. Enjoyed it.